So um, first of all, um, thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's a really great pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you very much for showing up as, uh, for the first talk in the morning. Um, some of you may be jet lagged um, or like the other way around, jet lagged. this is afternoon for you now, so this is easy. Um, so um, yes, so my name, my name is Tom Schall. I'll, I'll um, talk today about um, deep reinforcement learning. And I've been giving a talk on deep reinforcement learning for a while and um, uh, I realized that maybe I need to change things around because um, in the beginning I was giving this talk, um, I was giving a talk on, on deep reinforcement learning and I felt like I had to convince people that reinforcement learning is a meaningful, sensible thing to pursue, it's an interesting research direction, like let's try this kind of thing, uh, this is interesting. And um, now I guess the, the, the times have changed a bit and I don't need to convince anyone anymore. There's, there's, a, there's a bubble around deep reinforcement learning. Um, so I can now actually talk about the things that I think are the next step. I'm not, not, not defending um, why you should do it at all, but like think of, oh, so where, where can we go next? What's, what's the new directions? What's the, um, the, the cool stuff w that keeps us awake at night? Um, on, on this topic. And uh, so I made a new talk. This is the first time I'm giving the talk, so be, be a bit gentle with me with the questions. Um, and um, uh, let's dive in. So um, I'm at DeepMind, and um, DeepMind, we have, we have this kind of like um, long-term vision that um, it, it's possible to achieve um, general purpose artificial intelligence, AGI, or maybe human level intelligence, that this is, that this is feasible, it's not a mirage, it, it's something that we might actually get to, but it's, it's clearly like one of these long-term goals. It's visible on the horizon, um, but there's a lot of fog on the way there. Um, and um, so what is reinforcement learning? We, we consider reinforcement learning, well, I consider reinforcement learning to be one of the fields that um, is plausible uh, as lying on the path towards um, general intelligence. Um, so uh, let me put up the, the classical picture, reinforcement learning, an agent on the left interacts uh, with an environment on the right. Uh, the interface is simple, actions go one way, uh, observations and rewards come back. Now this, this of course, all of you have seen this, but um, let's, let's look a li little bit more closely at this, on what this actually means. Um, so what are some interesting properties here? Well, I mean, reinforcement learning has the property of being interactive, so the actions are meaningful, and sequential, so that means that the actions I take now affect the states of the future, affect the actions I can take in the future and change the world, essentially. Um, so this is important, this makes things much harder than if you just, like every time you see an, an input, you can, like, as if you were, had just been born at that moment in time, start um, acting from, from scratch. Um, there's also a nice thing about this, um, which makes it easier, which is that there's a very clear, succinct metric of success. It's this reward signal. If we maximize the sum of rewards, we're good. That's, that's defining what good means. Um, and so this is, this is helpful. Um, and then something that's, that's often a little bit um, hidden away, and not everybody actually agrees with that, but um, we, we assume in, in the general reinforcement learning framework that the environment is non-stationary. The world can change. Uh, if I interact um, uh, with the world today and in, I interact with it tomorrow, things may have changed slightly. I assume probably physics is the same, but um, I don't know, there might be another uh, political rule, there might be um, uh, another weather, things may have subtly changed and I may have to adapt my behavior to the world in a way in, in, in that doesn't come back. I, I, cannot, I cannot not really assume that I can ever reset my state to a point in the past. And this non-stationarity is, is, um, is something we, we um, um, I think, want to embrace. It's, it's real and so uh, let's not uh, hope it goes away, but let's embrace it. So why would we want to do reinforcement learning? Why would we want to put ourselves in this kind of setting with this like, very minimal interface with the world? Well, it turns out that the real world uh, and problems in the real world often have this structure. Many real world problems are non-stationary. Uh, many of them are involving sequential uh, decisions and many of them are interactive where um, you need to um, uh, act. You cannot just passively observe and predict. Um, the other reason why we want to do reinforcement learning is because reinforcement learning agents, the way they are designed, are autonomous. They don't need a teacher, they don't need supervision, they don't necessarily need imitation or anything like that. They are just given this like success signal, the reward signal, um, and they can learn about tasks. As, as soon as you can define what success means, um, you can, in principle, train an agent that becomes really good at that, which means that you could train reinforcement learning agents that are good at things that humans are not good at, and um, uh, uh, learn really uh, competent skills and surpass human 
level of, of, um, of skill. And so this is the reason, those two, those two points are the reason that we think that um, reinforcement learning might be rich enough as a setup for general purpose AI. Um, okay, so now let me give you the flip side of this. Why is reinforcement learning hard? Um, so um, it's for the exact same reasons. All of these properties actually make it also difficult. So the, these sequential interactions, um, what that means is that you need to explore. You can't just passively wait for the data to come to you. And when you have enough data, you train a classifier or something like that, and then you're done. You need to actually act in the world. You need to seek out the data that's interesting. You need to seek out um, the experiences that, that you learn. And if you don't do that well, you'll learn very inefficiently or maybe not at all. Um, the other um, flip side is that this reward signal is very nice. It's very clear on what the right thing is. But often the right thing is something very sparse. Say you get a reward of plus one once you finish your PhD. And um, that's something that you cannot do a lot of learning on because it takes a long time. It takes many actions in order to uh, try out a PhD. And so you um, um, may be very like... Um, may have a, a low like sample efficiency. If you count just the number of bits of signal that tell you what is good and bad coming in, it's, it's very small in, in many realistic scenarios. Uh, if you don't do anything special about this reward function. And then of course this non-stationarity makes everything harder, right? Uh, and in particular one thing it does in, um, in our agent is it tends to lead to things like instability. Where the agent was good today, the world changes and now it's really bad. And that's also something um, that we need to deal with and that makes it hard. Okay, so what is deep reinforcement learning? Um, well, that's very easy. It's basically the same thing, except now on the solution side. Inside the agent, there's somewhere a deep neural network. That's essentially it. Um, and there's different kinds of, um, of this. There's different flavors of this. Um, the two most common ways, of the, the two most common places of where to put the neural network inside the agent is um, to represent, uh, to use it as a function approximator to represent either the policy so the policy is this object pi um, that maps between um, states uh, where you are and actions, what you do right now. Um, and uh, the second uh, place where you could use neural, uh, deep neural networks are to model value functions. Value functions basically tell you how good something is. It, they tell you this state has this value, so that would be a V of S, or it tells you a bit more precisely in this state if you take this action that has this value. And value basically means um, the expected cumulative uh, reward. So how much reward can I get from here on out um, in the state or in the state given this action? Um, and so why would we want to make reinforcement learning deep? Why, why use uh, powerful function approximators? Is that something um, useful? And I guess there's a couple of reasons why we might want to do that. One of them is um, kind of a, practic a very practical one is that if you don't want to engineer features for your problem, um, just in deep learning in general, if you don't want to do feature engineering um, and if you just want to train the system end-to-end -end from the raw inputs to the raw outputs, which in this case the outputs are actions, um, then you can use uh, deep reinforcement learning to do so. So for example, you can have a neural network <coughs> that maps directly between pixel inputs and um, joystick actions or something like that. Uh, this allows you to scale to larger domains and of course these uh, learned representations um, that, that we all know um, are because of the the, the many layers of computation in, in our deep networks, these abstractions, these, these representations can be very powerful. And I guess one of the, the examples for that is something like AlphaGo um, that, um, that learned to represent lots of deep knowledge about the game of Go in just um, like 40 or so layers uh, of a deep um, policy network in this case. Or value, it actually was a policy network and value network. So how does this, um, field of reinforcement learning look like look right now. So there's, there's basically lots of like well-established um, uh, approaches, um, uh, let's say down here. And uh, in, in, in the recent past, there's been a couple of breakthroughs that have opened up the field that have um, triggered new developments. I guess two of the big developments are DQN, Deep Q Networks, this, this uh, demonstration that you can learn to play Atari games uh, directly from pixels. Um, and then AlphaGo that uh, demonstrated that you can surpass uh, lots of built-in human knowledge and um, like carefully crafted search uh, by replacing some of these bits with, with reinforcement learning and, and deep networks. And since then, there's been a whole boom uh, in the field. There's been lots of papers, lots of approaches. People are really starting to cover this field. And like, it looks like we're getting closer to this mountain in the background. We're making, we're making real progress. 
and uh, it's, a, it's an exciting time. But for today's talk, I actually want to take a little bit, take you all on a little bit on a detour. And I think we should go a bit sideways, not directly aim for um, the, the general AI, uh, but look a bit um, on the side of what else we can do in this space uh, with this kind of uh, interface, with this kind of setup. And so this is my uh, one slide to remember a uh, bit. The key idea, the key message I want to convey in this talk is that we should learn about many things. And learn about many things in this specific case means let's not just do the learning about the reward signal. Uh, the, we know the reward signal is the one thing that we care about, but learning only about the one thing that we care about may not be enough just because of all of these difficulties. And um, so let, let's do that. Let's, let's uh, learn about many things in this kind of setting. Um, because if we can do so, then um, we can surpass some of these difficulties. So for example, if the, if the reward is sparse, um, that means that the learning about the reward is going to be very slow. There's very few bits of information flowing in. But if we learn about many other things, maybe we can learn uh, lots of useful knowledge, useful skills, uh, build up good representations, build up good maybe partial policies and so on, without even seeing the reward. And then when we see the reward, it might help us to very quickly figure out how to maximize it. Um, also, the um, issue of exploration. As I said, like exploration means you need to seek out the um, experience, the data, the sequences of actions that give you the most information. Um, this uh, issue of exploration becomes less harsh if you're learning about many things, because presumably, Anything new and crazy that you try out is going to teach you about something. You learn something new uh, for every kind of experience. And so this makes it, makes it much more tolerant. You don't need to get uh, exploration exactly right. Uh, you just need to um, um, like gently cover the space of, of possibilities and you're always going to learn something. Um, and then there's um, the third difficulty, this difficulty of the non-stationarity might also become easier if we're learning about more than just reward. Um, especially in the case where the non-stationarity comes from a non-stationarity of the task. So if, say, the physics and the general dynamics of the world remain the same, your body roughly remains the same, or changes only very slowly, but the, uh, the task or the reward function uh, keeps changing very quickly. Like, you start caring about different things, the, the prices and values of different things keep changing in your world. Then um, this, this extra learning about many other things um, can give you extra stability because presumably uh, many of the things you learn don't change as fast as the reward. And uh, learning to, to control and, and, and predict many of these other things might give you the kinds of knowledge and skills that are necessary to uh, maximize the reward, uh, even if, if it changes fast. So uh, if, I give you, if, I, if I show you a new game to play and I tell you what the rules are, um, within a few attempts you'll be able to play that game uh, because you've built up um, skills that are, that are generic, that can deal with with object and, and agent and so on. Okay, so this um, um, was the, the motivation bit. I hope that um, um, I, I've, I've, I've gotten your interest on like uh, why reinforcement learning might be a good thing and that there's interesting things to be doing in that space. And then this key idea of learning about many things is, is what I'll go into a bit of detail now. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll uh, try and clarify what I mean, like what are these many things? And uh, what are the kinds of questions that we might want to ask? What are the kind of questions we might want to uh, build knowledge about and uh, learn answers for? Then I'm going to um, um, ask the question of like, okay, so if there's many such questions we want to learn, how can we represent the knowledge? How can we represent the answers? Um, and then if we can represent them, how can we learn them? Um, and let's assume everything goes rosy in, in all of this sequence of events and we have the answers to many such questions available, now how do we use them in order to get more reward or to be just better in our interactions with the world? Okay, and um, be, before I get into the details, let me just um, put up um, this, this slide that's basically giving you all the references. So I'm going to talk about six papers um, that, are, that I'm, I'm cherry picking um, different aspects from. So these are six papers that all are in this theme. They are all trying to do reinforcement learning but learn about more um, than just reward. Um, and I'll uh, refer to them on the different slides with their abbreviations because they are a bit long to, um, to eat, uh, all the time have up there. So I'll, I'll talk about the forecast paper, um, which talks about the questions, then uh, the UFA paper, universal value functions, uh, the Unreal paper. Um, then there's one paper that has two abbreviations because it actually has two ideas in it. Uh, it has the successor features and generalized policy improvement, uh, SF and GPI. Um, then FUN stands for Feudal Networks and the Unicorn is a paper that we've just put on archive that's under submission right now 
uh, that puts many of these things together. And the thing I'm not going to talk about uh, is um, performance metrics. So all of these papers have big experiments, big results, um, curves going up, showing that this method is better than that method and that we can uh, make progress uh, compared to some baselines. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, this is all very valuable and very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, so please have a look at the papers. Uh, you can trust me that these methods actually work, um, but um, I'm not going to tell you how much, how many percentage points better or which Atari game we can now solve, but um, they, they all have interesting properties in performance space, but uh, what I'm going to try to convey here is the intuitions, the, the, the key insights, and then maybe on um, what we can do with these key insights and how we can build up into um, to new directions for, for deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so let's dive in. Uh, maybe before we dive in, is there any questions so far? Is this okay, still clear? All right. Um, so let's, let's dive into what kinds of questions we might want to ask. Um, of course, we can ask questions about lots of different quantities. As an agent, uh, what the, the, the immediate and the obvious thing to ask questions about is our uh, perceptions, our observation stream. Um, um, we can also ask questions about the reward uh, signal itself that go beyond just um, its value function. So we, we can, uh, for example, in distributional reinforcement learning, um, do this thing where we um, try and model the entire distribution of outcomes rather than just uh, its mean. Um, we can, of course, augment our space and we can say, okay, we know we want to learn about many things. Let's give some hints to the agent and tell it which signals matter. Maybe add extra signals in so that it's easier. Um, and um, we can uh, use ideas from, from multitask learning uh, to, to kind of augment the space and say, like, actually, here's a world, there's many different things you might want to achieve, and I'm going to tell you some of the things you might want to achieve. I'm going to tell you about the, the space of tasks in this world. Um, and I'm going to make that available to the agent so that it can learn about many things at once. Um, but then there's also things that are more autonomous, that are, are less um, from the outside, which are like uh, asking questions about internal features. So, so the agent presumably builds up some kind of representations of the world, and I can ask questions about those things as well, and uh, learn answers for those questions again, and, and like basically recurse. Um, so how do we represent a question? What, what, uh, let, let's, find, let's define a, a grammar or a language over questions. And what I'm going to suggest is to um, have them in the form of a forecast. So what is a forecast? A forecast is um, a conditional, predictive, long-term question. Uh, it's defined by a triplet. Um, the first element is the cumulant. It's um, also called a pseudo-reward function. It's basically a scalar number, the quantity of interest. You accumulate this quantity over time. Um, then the second ingredient is the continuation probability, gamma, sometimes called discount. Um, and that basically defines um, the time scale, uh, the horizon on which you want to ask that question. Um, and um, third, um, the thing that makes it conditional is a policy. So um, the, the forecast is always conditioned on some kind of policy that defines under which behavior do I want to accumulate the cumulant until I terminate. Uh, and that one can be implicit or not. And this um, is very similar to uh, something known as generalized value functions or GVFs. So can I ask a question? Yeah. Maybe, go ahead, maybe over here. I'll give an example now. Yeah, yeah. And it's, so you can, the agent can choose its own reward now? Um, so so let, let's, let's, keep re, let's keep reward and cumulant separate. So cumulant is basically, uh, there's many questions, every question has a cumulant, and I'll, I'll use the term reward just for the real reward, the external reward, the spa that is like this one special scalar that defines what is good and bad. Um, but of course, um, like you, you can see already that these cumulants act as rewards, and the, the learning algorithms treat them as if they were rewards and so on. So th there's a lot of things that, um, that we can basically inherit in from um, from reinforcement learning, from, from the, the classical reinforcement learning where we, there's one scalar, uh, except that now we'll have many such cumulants, and so we'll do these things for, for all of these things in parallel. Okay, any other questions? Uh, so let's, let's give a couple of examples. So there's um, uh, a simple question I could ask is, like, how many steps does it take me to cross this room? Um, in this case, the cumulant would be um, one for each step I take, um, the, the probability um, of, of continuation, uh, gamma would be one all along and then zero when I hit the, when I'm able to reach the wall. And the policy would be the policy that uh, walks towards that wall. So this is a, a simple question I can ask, I can formulate, 
um, and I can, I can guess the answer. I can say, ah, 27 or something like that. And then uh, I can check. I can actually walk there, count my steps, and check whether my answer is right and wrong, update my estimate. Um, another example would be um, the question like, will I see the sun today? Um, so here the cumulant would be one, uh, if and only if there's some like, uh, sunlight that directly hits my retina. Uh, when that happens, I, I stop. And uh, when it's midnight tonight, uh, I'll also stop. So that would be the, the cumulant and the, um, uh, the discount. And the policy under this question would be the typical policy, my typical behavior policy, what I tend to do in, in life. Uh, maybe I look out of the window a little bit more just to check, but th that's essentially it. But uh, notice that I could make this question slightly different if uh, instead of saying, will I see the sun today, I could say, could I see the sun today? Um, it's the same cumulant, it's the same discount, but now the policy is different. Now the policy is a policy that would try to maximize this, the probability of this event happening. And here the answer would probably be different, right? Because the question, if, if, if I were to say, like, could I see the sun today? Probably the answer is yes, because I could like, run to the airport, try to get on a plane that gets me above the cloud coverage, and I could see the sun. Um, and so um, the, the conditioning on the policy is really important. Um, and there's some nice properties to formulating your questions this way. The, the, the first property is the property that, that underlies many of the methods in, in reinforcement training is this Markov property that all of these components just depend on your state, that you don't need to have anything extra special. Um, and that allows you to do some um, kind of efficient updates. You can do um, uh, Bellman equations and, and these kinds of things. So this, is, this is very powerful. Um, the uh, other nice property is unlike um, predictive state representations or PSRs, um, this is closed loop, which means that um, it doesn't depend on the exact timings or the exact action sequences, but it's, it, it, you can make it conditional on policies. Um, and the horizons are also unbounded, um, so it's not like, it's not the same than having like um, uh, case step predic predictions that say in seven steps, how will the world look like? Um, because I can ask directly a question about an outcome, outcome independently of when it happens. Instead of having um, predictions about all of the k, uh, k step predictions uh, that would lead to that outcome, I just have a single, single question that has um, um, a termination probability that just says, ah, I've reached it, now I can stop. Um, and so this is, this is very nice. But I think the, um, the biggest advantage of these kinds of questions is that they are subjective uh, and subjectively verifiable. The agent can just walk to the end of the, uh, the room and count and check and, and update its estimates. And um, I think this is, this is something we need if we want to have systems that build up knowledge in an autonomous way where there's nobody giving them ground truth. There's nobody that comes with the ground truth label. The only way for them to figure out what is right and wrong is to be able to try. They have to be in a world in which they can execute the policy and then try it out and see if their answers were right or wrong. Okay, so um, let, let's see what we can do with this. Um, um, I'll do a couple of slides on just um, giving some hints on how you could build up large sets of such questions from, from, from very simple things. Um, and so a, a, a simple place to start would be just um, on your raw uh, perceptions, on your observation space, you make some, uh, you ask some questions about these things. Will this pixel be uh, green at this point in time? Will, what's the sum over, um, um, my touch sensor over on, on this horizon going to be, things like that. And then um, you start from that, that's your, your, your layer zero of, of forecasts. And then um, you learn answers for these forecasts. And then you use the answers um, to ask new questions. So the, the, uh, in, in this particular case, for example, um, we, we have these value functions for, let's say, forecast one. Uh, F1 is, is one of these uh, low level forecasts that's, that's grounded. And then the value function for this forecast, um, uh, we're going to um, uh, threshold it and say whenever that value function is above its median, then uh, some other, the cumulant of some other forecast is one, and otherwise it's zero. And so now we get kind of a partitioning in, in, in value space across, um, across these things. And like if you do this on a little grid world, um, uh, this is an example from the paper, you start out with a forecast that has just a single bit, a single binary touch sensor that says, is there a wall in front of me? Um, and um, uh, you build a value function um, that, that smooths this over time. Then you, um, you binarize that value function again. You use that as the, the, um, the cumulant for the next one and so on. And you build up kind of a tree of such things. So you start with one binary signal and you build a tree of value functions around it, a tree of questions, a value function for it, and then two new questions and so on. 
Um, and uh, what you get is you get these kinds of um, features that, ha that seem to um, come to represent relatively qualitative things like, um, um, let me point with a pointer. Uh, like here, for example, you, you see that um, uh, the red areas are all on dead ends. So there's these, these room structures, they have dead ends, and all of the dead ends are now marked in red. There was nothing that was telling it about rooms. I mean, the, the agent doesn't see the top-down view. It just sees, it just has touch sensors. But because you build them up like that, it, it figures out certain, certain properties here. Like the, 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 the bright area basically is the hallways that are not in rooms. Here you, you get a value function that's uh, like something like measuring the distance to this far corner and so on. And so you can get um, from a very simple construction, very rich, um, seemingly useful features. And you can, you can show in the paper that these are actually also useful for performance. OK, so, so maybe we have questions. Maybe we have a way of formulating many questions. Um, maybe we can like, um, build up as many as we like for that. So now, how can we represent all of these answers? Um, first of all, what is an answer? An answer is, as I said, a value function. Um, this is the only equation in, in, in the talk, um, and um, it's, it's not very complicated. It's a very classical value function equation. Um, it says the, the value function for the forecast f, um, and the value function is always at a state, so at, at a state s, it's the expectation under the policy, so that, as I said, all forecasts are conditioned on a policy, it's, it's the expectation under the policy pi f um, of this, this infinite sum, and it's an infinite sum over these cumulants, um, uh, at the states we encounter along the way, uh, but then discounted by the product of these gammas that we've encountered along the way. And as you can see from, from this, this form, is like as soon as um, there's a, a discount of zero, as soon as we, we terminate anywhere along that sequence, we can forget about the rest of the infinite sum. So the sum actually never is infinite because this term uh, is, is going to truncate um, at, at some point or, or just, just vanish, become vanishingly small. Okay, so that's, that's what answers are. Now, how do we represent the answers? Um, uh, the, the, the obvious, the simple thing that, that we've um, done in the past and that, that works, that which is fine, is to just represent them separately. We have a value function, a value network um, that maps between states and values, and we have one of these for each question. Um, like, as you can imagine, this, this works nicely because it disentangles everything, but it also doesn't scale very well. If you want hundreds or thousands or even millions of questions, now this is going to become very burdensome. Um, the alternative on the other end of the spectrum is to be completely universal and to say, um, uh, to treat the forecast, the, the formulation of the question, as an input and to have a network that has two inputs. Now, um, it has a, the state as an input like usual, but it uh, takes a second input, which is some representation of the question <coughs> and just predicts, uh, spits out one number that says what's the value of that. And then, of course, on that spectrum, there's many other ways of, of sharing knowledge between the different questions. Uh, a simple one that you might think about is, for example, you have a deep network and you go through a few layers until some hidden um, representation H. And then from there on, you hang off many heads and each head represents one of the value functions. Uh, and there's, of course, many other variants in between here. Um, and so I'm going to talk about two uh, particular examples that we've, that we've experimented with. Um, the first one is uh, what we call um, successor features. So successor features uh, make a stronger assumption. They, they are not quite fully general purpose, but they, they make uh, one assumption and then they can simplify uh, things from there on out. So the one assumption is that these cumulants live in a linear space. That all cumulants that we care about can be represented in this form, um, where there's um, um, this feature vector phi of s um, which is independent of the, um, of the task of the question, um, that is just multiplied with a weight vector w. And so for every w, you get a cumulant, and all possible cumulants are in this form. Um, uh, this is uh, an idea from, from Peter Diane from like a long time ago. And um, what you can do in this space is, like what, what you can observe in this space is that because of this structure, the value functions will have a, the same structure, except now instead of Phi of s, you will have a term psi of s. Psi is going to be something like the equivalent, um, uh, the analog from a reward to value and these proto rewards to um, successor features. So the successor features capture uh, what's happening in the long run under the certain policy. Um, and um, they are the only thing that depends on the state. And this w is just like multiplied with it to get the value function. And what this means is that um, if you have just one policy and one um, termination function, 
then you can, uh, you can learn this quantity once, and then this is just a linear operation where you can read out any value function you like for any w you like um, in, in just a simple step. Um, and the advantage, as I said, is that like this, this zero-shot transfer, basically like being able to read out the answer for new uh, cumulants immediately uh, is very nice. Um, um, the disadvantage, of course, is that you need a separate um, set of successor features, a separate psi for each policy and for each uh, termination function. And so it's, it's maybe not quite scalable enough yet, but it's already uh, disentangling one of the dimensions. Um, if we want to go a bit more general, we can um, um, do this with um, universal value functions. And um, the trick here is um, that we assume that we can find a representation of, of the question, an embedding, uh, G, that represents, um, that represents these, this triplet. So G represents the cumulant, the discount, and the policy. And um, uh, then we will just a single um, function approximate, a single neural network that takes two inputs, the state and the um, embedding of the, of the question, and it spits out one number. Um, and the nice thing about this is if this embedding space where the Gs live in is, is reasonably well structured, we might even be able to get generalization. So we might be able to learn about some questions and then interpolate or extrapolate to similar questions and already have decent answers just because of the properties of generalization of, of the neural network. Um, and in this space like this, the, 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 the set of all, all such triplets is, is rather large. Um, so let's, let's consider one special case that might be of interest here. And it's the, um, the forecasts that have this form here, where the, um, the policy is not a free parameter anymore. The policy is implicitly defined. And uh, given a cumulant and a discount, we're going to define the policy as the optimal policy for that cumulant. So the policy that seeks out this kind of pseudo reward. And now we, we don't need to parameterize quite as many things. We just need to parameterize our um, cumulant and our termination. And then the policy is implicitly given. So this, this, um, this makes it easier um, uh, to represent. It also has some nice properties. That means that like all of the knowledge that we're building is knowledge that is optimal with respect to something. So all of these, um, these value functions are about um, optimal policies. And because in the end, we know we'll want to have uh, the optimal policy with respect to the external reward, maybe having this inductive bias to learn more about optimal stuff than about non-optimal stuff is going to be good. Okay, so what, what kinds of architectures can we use here? Um, there's, there's, a, the, there's a wide range. We experimented with a, 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 a range of different things. Um, they all work to some extent. Um, so the, the, um, this is the diagram in, in abstract, and then in practice you can do something like this. You can concatenate the inputs, pass them through your network, um, and spit out a number. You can process the two, two streams of, of, of states and goals, or states and questions, separately for a while, and then just combine them at the end uh, with, for example, a dot product. Or you can have something in between. Uh, all of these things work uh, quite well. This, this two-stream approach in, in, our, uh, in the UFA paper uh, actually worked, worked really well. Uh, but that's not to say that this is the only way. There's, there's other papers that did different things that also worked. Um, and um, yeah, so what, what's the advantage of doing this, this uh, in a universal way? Well, this generalization across questions, of course, is, is, um, is very powerful. Again, it gives us a form of, of zero-shot transfer. It gives us a possibility to ask uh, about a new question and immediately get some answer. That might not be the right answer yet, but it's, it's going to be a good starting point. And then we can uh, very quickly adapt from there. And so you get, get results where basically, instead of having to learn from scratch, you start, like the zero-shot bit is, is, is already giving you something reasonable. And then from there on, learning is very fast uh, ver versus uh, if you had to learn about the, the task from scratch. And because it generalizes across questions, it scales, across, uh, it scales to, a, to a very large number of them, of course. Uh, the disadvantage is, is the same, uh, comes from the same source than its advantage, is that everything is in one network, so we have a fixed capacity to, um, to stuff all this knowledge in, and um, this is going to work for a while, but at some point we'll start getting interference. Um, maybe even quite soon we'll get interference. And, um, and this might be, might be quite damaging. So this is um, an unresolved question of like, uh, how much can we stuff into, into these networks? Okay, so now um, I guess we have the, the two ingredients. We have questions, we have a way of representing the answers. Now, um, how can we learn the answers? 
Um, so um, I have good news here. Um, basically, more or less everything we tried works. So this, this, is, this is something that is rare in reinforcement learning. Of, yeah. Often, uh, almost everything you try doesn't work, and then you find one thing that works. Here, uh, basically, every paper did something else in order to, uh, to learn these answers. And all of the methods had, um, had some, some reasonable amount of success. So it probably doesn't matter exactly how you learn them. You can just use your preferred um, um, reinforcement learning techniques and, and go with them, and they, they might be able to, to capture this kind of knowledge. Uh, so the things we did try was, in, in the forecast paper, we had least squares me methods like LSTD. Uh, in the UFA paper, we did uh, matrix decomposition uh, and trained these streams separately instead of end-to-end. -end. That worked really well. In uh, the feudal networks paper, we had an online, on-policy actor critic setup, um, a bit like A3C, but a bit more. I'll, I'll, I'll have another slide on that, on how it works exactly. And in these other papers, we did Q-learning, multi-step Q-learning, uh, either with experience replay or without, um, and um, uh, to with, with some amount of parallelism. And then in the successive feature paper, we trained these things separately and for each of the questions on policy. So we would actually execute the policies that we were asking the questions about. And then in the unicorn paper, we did the opposite. We did, trained all of them jointly and off policy. So all of the experience um, was, was used to train all of the questions. Uh, and all of these setups worked to some extent. So um, uh, because, um, it's <coughs> Sorry. because it's the most recent one, and I actually think it's the most scalable one, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the last one, of what, what we did in, in the case of the, um, of the unicorn. Um, so um, um, the setup here was uh, one of these um, simplified setups where uh, we were given the cumulants. The cumulants were, were provided to us by, by the, the, the task. Um, by the domain, and uh, th they was, it was a discrete set of cumulants, and um, the answers were rep represented with a UFA, but it's uh, because it's a discrete, like it's a basically a UFA with just a discrete set of possibilities as what, um, what G could be. And um, uh, on, on the exploration side, we did something very simple. Uh, we did basically did uniform exploration in gold space or in, um, in cumulant space. So for every episode, we would pick another G out of the set and uh, try and maximize that for an episode, gather the experience for that uh, with, with an epsilon around it. Um, and then for every transition of experience, for every bit of, of data that we saw, we would try and learn about all of the tasks. Um, uh, simultaneously and of policy. Um, so the, um, the of policy bit we had to basically correct for the fact that um, if you would have cared about another uh, cumulant, if you would have tried to optimize another cumulant, then um, you would have taken different actions. And so basically these trajectories are, are cut short at the points where the actions change. So um, if, if you have uh, um, the task of, of uh, getting an apple and the task of getting an orange and both of these are in front of you, you'll walk straight towards them. And so you can use the experience that walks towards both um, for updating both of these value functions. Uh, but then as soon as they, di they diverge, where for one you turn left and for the other you turn right, you cut the trace and, um, and just uh, update the one where you actually follow it. Um, and so this, this worked quite nicely. We have this um, a nice little demonstration um, task in, in the paper that um, I'm, again, I'm not going to talk too much about the performance of this, but I'm just going to give you the qualitative um, difficulty. So it's, it's one of these um, uh, three-dimensional uh, labyrinth uh, DM lab um, worlds where um, there's many kinds of objects that you can encounter uh, and, and interact with. And um, the, the, the objective, the external reward, is very sparse. The external reward is only given if you do things in a particular sequence. If you first pick up a key, then a lock, then go through a door, then go to the chest. So if you do them in exactly the right order, um, then you get a reward of one. Otherwise, reward is always zero. And if you deviate from the sequence, so for example, if you do the key, lock, door, and then another key, you start over all from scratch. You can't just then uh, go to the chest. And so this, this makes it very difficult and means that if you're just randomly exploring, you might just never see uh, well, very, very rarely see any reward. And in, in this kind of setup where we, um, where we give these hints, we say to the agent, um, interacting with objects, those are interesting cumulants, you should learn about those things as well. It learns about all of these things uh, jointly with learning about the external reward, and um, the results are very good. I'm not going to uh, give you the details, but essentially you can do something qualitatively different. You can solve problems that would have a reward that is too sparse, 
um, and um, um, uh, get off the ground, whereas the baselines would just be stuck. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. You said you give it hints about, you tell it that it should go pick up objects or interact with them. How do you do that? By, by defining a set of questions. So the set of cumulants are the hints. So we, instead of just giving it the external reward, we give it a vector. And that, like the knowledge that this vector, like each of the dimensions of the vector corresponds to one object, that is the hint. That's basically saying objects matter. And the input is raw pixels, or it's augmented with annotations about what objects? So it's, the input is, is raw pixels, like usual. Um, but it has an, an, a special set of signals, these, these phi signals that, that basically say um, uh, they, are, they are always zero except when you, when you touch an object of that kind. Oh, and so it's, it's like enriching your space and giving you uh, this extra hint. You could, like, you could see it if, if you, like one of the interpretations of this is to say this is a multitask setup where <coughs> there's a task for every kind of object and um, I'm going to tell you how well you would do about all tasks all the time and then this vector would give you these rewards for all tasks. Uh, so that's another interpretation. But it's, it's definitely extra knowledge that you give to the agent that, uh, that like, otherwise the agent wouldn't be able to, to re recover. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, so we can ask many questions, we can represent many answers, we can learn about all of these things in parallel of policy with one experience stream, which is very nice. So what can we do with them? What can, how can we use um, this extra knowledge, these extra answers? And um, there's many um, uh, forms, uh, many ways in which we can use them. Um, of course, uh, as I, I alluded to, we can use them just directly for, for learning. We can use them to get off the ground um, to have more robust uh, learning, to build up better feature representations and so on. And I'll, I'll give an example, the example of Unreal, uh, to show this. Um, we can use them to get better exploration, uh, gather more diverse experience, because now we're not pursuing one thing, but we try to learn about many things. And if we also try to pursue many things while we explore, that might give us um, interesting data to learn from. And then, um, of course, we want to um, um, use them to maximize uh, external reward to, to, to Im increase our performance in some form. And I'll, I'll give the example of how we do that in, in the feudal networks. And then, uh, as, a last, as a third example that I'll give is uh, transfer. Uh, if, we, um, if we have knowledge about many uh, tasks or many, many uh, questions, we might be able to very quickly uh, learn how to act to maximize a new task. Um, so better features um, in, in Unreal. So um, Unreal is basically trying to do the minimal step and saying like if how much you can gain if you use the, this extra knowledge in, in the minimal way, in the sense that uh, you don't even look at what you've learned. You only learn about it kind of on the side and help it um, have it help you build the right hidden representations in your neural network. So this is this is the architecture. Um, uh, on, uh, in gray here on the left, you have your typical uh, actor critic. Uh, it, it goes from states through some hidden representations. It has a, a baseline or a value head that tells you how good you are. Uh, with respect to external reward, there's no, no, quest no other questions here. And you have a, a policy head that basically tells you uh, how to act according to external reward. And the, the gray bit is basically your, your A3C baseline. Um, that's, that's already doing some decent job at the task. And all we're going to do in, in Unreal is we're going to add some extra heads here um, that are going to ask these extra questions, uh, in this case about pixel intensities, and in that basically we, we, we segment the input space uh, into, into buckets and to try to minimize, uh, sorry, try to maximize pixel intensity changes in these different buckets. So it's a very simple thing. Uh, it's just an auxiliary prediction task. Uh, on the side, and uh, all that this, the only way that this influences the agent at all is that the gradients flowing from these um, extra values uh, help shape the hidden representations um, of the agent. And that by itself um, leads to quite dramatic performance increases. Good question. Yes? This works only for partition, right? So if you, if you actually, you know, in the real world, you feel like Um, sure. Why, why would there be a difference between the real and simulated? I mean, this is, this is just pick, um, you mean, like you could have a robot, uh, let, let's say this is a, a robot acting, and it has a camera, and now you're uh, predicting uh, how much your uh, light sensors will change 
right? That's an auxiliary prediction that you can add on top of your regular uh, robot learning algorithm. So there's no difference between simulation here. Well, the real world might mean sort of conditions that are complex. Sure. So it might be difficult to get the answers right, but that doesn't necessarily matter. Like in this case, it's also difficult to get the answers right, but it might already give you uh, the right hints. Like it might be that certain actions have like very dramatic effects on, 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 um, on your visual input. For example, these agents here, they have actions that allow them to change, move the head, and to look up in the sky changes all of the pixels dramatically. And uh, learning about that seems to be useful. Uh, it actually seems to be useful in order not to take the action. Because if you look up in the sky and then run around, you're a pretty bad agent because you don't see what's in front of you anymore. Um, but uh, being able to learn how to control your, your, your visual inputs is, I think, generally useful. And, and, and I don't think there's a difference between simulation here to the real world. It might actually be, be more useful in, in the real world because data is more valuable in the real world. Like you're, you're in a robot experiment, you just have uh, less time to try things out. So you may want to learn more about the things that you've actually seen, I, I, would, I would guess. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so now the question of hierarchy, um, feudal networks. So in this case, um, we, um, we um, defined the questions um, kind of in state space. So the, um, this, this S here is, is um, uh, a representation of state. It's internal to the agent. Uh, it, it's something that the agent has, like, it, it's at some depth of its processing. And um, the agent can ask, basically, questions about this um, state representation and can say, like, um, how can I maximize the change in this uh, in specific directions? So basically, it says, my cumulants are the cosine distance between um, the change in the state representation and some goal direction. So the goal direction says, go this way. Then I measure where I am now. I measure where I am uh, k steps into the future. And I measure the angle between those two directions. And um, uh, I ask questions about uh, how I can like minimize this angle and get as close to the uh, move as, as closely in the direction of the goal as, as possible. Um, and uh, in in this case, what what we did for for the um, in terms of representing it was a, a universal policy and a universal value function. So it's basically twice a UFA, one UFA on the on the left here that goes from state and goal to uh, the value function, and one on the right that goes from um, state and goal to the policy. And um, as you can maybe already guess here is if, if we want to do a hierarchy here, uh, it's actually relatively straightforward. So, so um, this, this, these goal directions G here, um, we can zoom out and see them as the action space of another agent. So there's, there's, there's a second agent, the, the, the base agent is the worker. There's a second agent, let's call it the manager, that, that sits on top and um, its uh, objective is to pick good goal directions. Um, it's more temporally abstract, so it changes slower. So maybe at, at the bottom level, you, you take actions all the time. At the higher level, you pick goal directions, but you don't change them all the time. So you slowly guide the low-level behavior. Um, and um, this is now just a regular reinforcement learning agent that just learns about the external reward only uh, and has a much simpler problem because it doesn't need to um, know too much about the details of the action space and what's going on. It, it, for it, um, it's enough to pick out the right goal directions such that the worker um, maximizes the external reward. And this is, an, this is a coupled system. We don't, we don't try train those in isolation because it's important to note that the, um, the worker isn't perfect for all goal directions. You can't ask it something that it has no idea how to do. And so um, there's, a, there's a, a joint learning problem here where uh, the manager sets directions for the worker. Um, the worker starts getting better at the things that it's been told to do, and then um, the manager can adapt and, and, and start uh, picking new directions or uh, giving up on, on, on setting certain kind of, it, it knows that certain kind of goal directions would be nice, but it also knows that the worker couldn't achieve them, and so it will try other things in order to get it to maximize reward. Okay, and so last um, uh, ingredient, last element um, I want to, to mention is this idea of uh, generalized policy improvement. Uh, or GPI, which um, is, is again a very simple thing. It's a little bit abstract. It's basically saying if we have many policies and we have their Q values, 
their estimates for how good every action is in every state. Um, we can just maximize over all of them. So have a, uh, pick the action that is the argmax both over actions and over policies. Uh, and if these are reliable uh, Q values, then um, we, um, we can basically act according to the policy that is currently the best in every state. So we can get this automatic switching between policies. Um, and um, under some, some assumptions, we can show that this switching policy that, that does the argmax here um, is better than any of its ingredients. So if you have a set of policies and you know their values, you can um, uh, get a, a switching policy that is better than any of the elements. So if, if uh, one of them is good in one part of the state space, the other one is good in the other part of the state space, this would automatically switch, switch between them and get you something that's good in both parts of the state space. Um, and um, in, in abstract, this is a little bit maybe, um, seems a bit odd, but like it, it happens to be very complementary um, to these uh, successor features. Um, uh, because of the, the way that the successor features um, uh, decompose, uh, as you remember, successor features uh, are these psi uh, vectors here that depend on a policy, and then the, the value function is the product of psi times w, and uh, because of that, you have these instant Q values of old policies on new tasks. So you have these things for old policies. You get a new task W coming in, and you immediately know how good all of the old policies would have been uh, or would be on the new task. And then you can, you can do GPI uh, over these Q values for old policies. Can you easily solve the maximization problem? Um, it, it's, just, it's just a max, right? It's, there's a oh, you mean if there's an infinite set of policies? No. Uh, so in the successor feature case, these are discrete. You have one successor feature uh, per policy, and they, they are treated. You don't have, um, this is not the case where the policies are an embedding. If you had an embedding, then you would need to search in policy space in some form. Yeah, you could, you could probably do that as well. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't tried that. Okay. All right, so, so this was, um, um, the, the main body of the talk, uh, we can ask many questions, we can represent the answers, we can learn about them, we can use them for good purposes. Um, the thing I've not shown you is that it leads to better results. Um, and um, qualitatively, are there now things that are now feasible in, in, in this like slightly expanded way of doing reinforcement learning that weren't before? Um, and the answer is yes, there's a few things we can do now that uh, we couldn't do before or not as easily could do before. Um, this this uh, notion of zero-shot transfer um, of value functions, getting a value function immediately uh, with just one dot product uh, on a new task or in a new question is, is very powerful. And then uh, paired with that, the idea of the GPI of uh, going from zero-shot values to zero-shot policies as well and allowing you to switch uh, between uh, old policies in, a, in an ideal way. Um, all of the work on, on, on the UFAS, on these universal values, allows us to now generalize across goals and questions, which is, which is very powerful because we know neural networks are good generalizers. Um, we, we assume that this is um, uh, going to, to, um, to work just as well in, in the space of goals than it did in the, sta in the space of states. Um, and um, uh, there's a notion of um, um, skills being refined continually. So if uh, in, in, in the case of the UFAS, <coughs> if you've learned about a few questions uh, in this like single object, so this is a single neural network that has learned about a number of things, and you keep training it on um, new tasks that are similar to old tasks, uh, if you learn something new uh, when you're training on the new task, because of generalization, this might improve your values or your policies on the old tasks as well. And so there might be some kind of uh, diffusion of knowledge uh, between the things you're currently training on and other things that, um, um, that you have in, 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 your, um, in your system. And in the best case, what will happen is that you train on task B and you happen to just get magically better on task A as well. This is the best case. Of course, the worst case is where these interfere. And as soon as you train on B, you destroy your knowledge of A. So both of these could happen. And uh, we, don't, we don't really have the, um, the answer on how to do it. So that it's always... The, uh, the good case. <coughs> we know a way of working around interference by keeping things separate, of course. Um, and then another thing that is, um, um, uh, I think, something that we can do now, which is really nice, is this, this idea of exploration 
that is abstract, where now the exploration happens in goal space rather than in, in, in state space or in parameter space or in action space, and um, uh, as, as, as shown by the feudal networks. And then in terms of very practical results, it's, it's really a matter of showing that if you learn about many things, you can now um, learn despite the reward for, uh, signal being very sparse. So you see very few rewards, and yet you can build up the knowledge and uh, get off the ground. Okay, so um, are there open issues? Is, are, are we done? No, of course we're not done. There's, there's a lot of open issues. This is um, just the beginning. This is just the, the sketching out the, the first directions. Um, the, the, the main directions that are open, I would say, there's, there's many, but the main ones are the question of discovery. Like, where do, we come, where do we get these questions from? How do we build these cumulants? How do we build them on top of each other? Um, uh, I've, I've, I've shown a few examples of what you can do, what does work, but it, this is not the end. It's just the beginning. Um, in terms of exploration, we've also just scratched the surface. Uh, treating um, goals as actions uh, is very elegant because it delegates the problem up to the next layer of hierarchy, um, but it's also maybe not quite um, uh, satisfying to have to delegate it up to another reinforcement learning problem. And so um, there's ideas of intrinsic motivation, uh, how to explore such that you learn about, um, uh, that, that you get, you want to explore such that you get experience that helps you learn about many things. Um, and uh, there might be ways of, of doing so in a, in, a, in a principled way. And then a topic that I haven't mentioned a lot, but um, is, I think, very deeply ingrained in here is, is trade-offs of learning. Um, so you can't necessarily always get the best of all worlds. You can't necessarily be good on everything. And so you may have to trade off between the different questions um, and uh, maybe ca even cast it as a multi-objective problem um, on, on, on what you want. Uh, you may also need to trade off between old knowledge and new knowledge, um, what in neuroscience is known as the stability plasticity dilemma of like, uh, how do you uh, keep learning without forgetting or without forgetting too much? And like setting that trade off right of like, how much do you value new experience and new knowledge versus how much you want to preserve things that you've learned in the past is, is not easy. Um, okay, so this is the summary. Um, um, what kinds of questions can we ask? Uh, well, let's formulate them as, as forecasts um, because that has some nice properties. Uh, we can represent the answers either with successive features or with universal value functions um, uh, quite efficiently. We can learn them off policy. We can learn them in parallel. Um, um, we can use them to get better features. We can use them in the form of a hierarchy. Uh, we can do policy composition. Now there's a few things that are feasible that weren't before. Uh, generalization across uh, questions and tasks, transfer, um, dealing with sparse rewards in a, in a better way. And there's a lot of open issues, so this is a, this is a big open field um, that um, I'm excited to, to, to keep pushing on. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, maybe just, just quickly, uh, let me just... Uh, uh, put up the image credits and um, just mention briefly that this is all joint work with many co-authors. Um, like I bolded their names here. Uh, this, this is not my own work uh, to a large extent. Um, and uh, it, all of this work is very, very collaborative. And of course, this is also not just work done at DeepMind. There's a whole bunch of groups at, at other companies and universities working on very similar topics, uh, which I've not really gone into detail on. Um, so in non-reinforcement learning, so we're stateless, if you like, one of the big advances looking over decades is the degree to which you explicitly model uncertainty of what you think you know, right? So, you know, you write these value functions and you've got all of this complicated knowledge that you're trying to learn, but as I understand it, you're not trying to carry around the uncertainty of your knowledge as it goes. Can you comment on that? I mean, is this feasible? Is it actually a problem? Or is it the case that for some reason it's not so important with stateful learning problems like you study? No, I, I think this is definitely important. It's definitely something um, that matters. And it probably matters more um, the more knowledge you try to build because, because we know we can't represent everything accurately. We know we will be making trade-offs. And it's really important to know what we know and know where we are accurate and where we're not. <coughs> Uh, for example, this 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 double this double argmax um, only works if 
uh, all of the ingredients are roughly equally certain. If some of them are very noisy estimates and some are very certain estimates, it doesn't work at all. It will just latch onto the noise. Uh, so the uncertainty is, is very important. It's something we absolutely need to do. And there's, um, there's a lot of work. This is um, something that's been, I think, now a year and a half that it's, it's become like kind of its own kind of subfield of reinforcement learning called distribu distributional reinforcement learning, where people model um, uh, the distributions of outcomes explicitly. They would try to model the uncertainty. They try to distinguish the uncertainty of the estimates from the variance of the problem and so on. And so there's, this is definitely um, part of the solution. And um, I, I, I briefly alluded to uh, a paper of Mark Belmar, who was one of the initiators of that. But um, there's, there's a lot of work going on. And it's definitely something that we're, we're using in, in many of these um, approaches. So when, whenever we consider like real-world applications of reinforcement learning, so there's always a gap between like, real system and simulators. For example, yes. some, some robot. So have you ever done any like, systematic approach to like, filling the gap between real world and simulators? So, so I, um, I think this reinforcement learning has been um, uh, slow to be adopted in, the in, in many real world problems because um, uh, generally speaking, it's, it's, um, it requires a lot of data. It requires yeah. a lot of experience. Because it's trial and error, um, you need to just um, gather a lot of, of, of these trajectories. And um, this is difficult enough, and it's very expensive in, in real-world settings. And um, it's worse than just being expensive, because often in the real-world setting, you actually can't really afford to make mistakes. You can't train, um, I don't know, a robot uh, that interacts with humans, for example, just by uh, reinforcement and say, like, every time you hurt a human, I give you a minus one. That doesn't work. Nobody will, society will not accept that, mm -hmm. right? So you need to be able to produce something that's already working before you roll it out in, in many cases. Uh, and there's real strong business reasons to not, say, do exploration, like yeah. try out many things. But I do think that um, this idea of, of learning about many things, mm -hmm. like um, squeezing out all of the knowledge you can from the data that you do have, mm -hmm is a good direction, that it's, 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 it's getting us a couple of steps closer mm -hmm. to what we can do in the real world. Um, I, I think we're still not quite there yet for, for many of the applications, mm -hmm. but we're, we're definitely seeing progress, I would say. Oh. Thank you. Yes. So, so I think all these are, all these are very um, good ideas. Are, we, are you trying to essentially trying to get closer to model-based? Because you're learning many things. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're trying to build a sort of model the world implicitly, but yes. would it be better to build a sort of a model explicitly and leverage, you know, the, you know, explicit model? And then that, that could get you really far, right? Yes, yes. So this is a very, very good question. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so it turns out this is plan B. Um, plan A was to, like, build a model of the world, plan with the model, solve everything in in, in just uh, imagination, just with planning, and then um, roll out the policy. It turns out that in practice, this doesn't really work very well. In practice, uh, learning a model often is difficult uh, because uh, it tends to have these um, accumulating errors. If you have small errors in your model and you unroll it for a long time, the errors explode and you can't trust its outcome. Um, and if you don't have a perfect model, then, then this is um, uh, actually hurting you more than it helps often. Uh, there's, there's domains where this works really well. I mean, AlphaGo is, is the prototypical case. There's a perfect model, you're given the perfect model, and with a perfect model you can do like, very impressive things. But if you're not having a perfect model, and if it's difficult, like the real world is complicated, and it's difficult, uh, let's say I'm, I'm going to claim it's impossible to learn a perfect model, and it's difficult to learn a good enough model so that you can plan in it. And because of that, uh, I mean, of course, people have tried model-based reinforcement learning for a long time. We have as well. Um, there's a lot of my colleagues that have, have tried and failed and tried and failed um, to do the, um, the obvious thing of like just learn the transitions of your world and then plan with it. And it turns out that um, something more implicit um, may be easier to handle, something that doesn't try to get this uh, modeling right at the granularity of the time step. I think that's, that's the big problem with many model-based approaches is that it's, it's at like time step per time step. And because of that, you need to um, accumulate errors across long, long sequences, and this is, this is dangerous. Uh, whereas these ones don't have time steps. These are value functions. They just say, like, uh, they, make, they, they spit out one number that kind of smooths over a long future at some horizon. And this is much more robust to, to, uh, to noise and to, um, to uncertainty. This would be very hard to handle not, not stationarity, right? Because 
you know, you don't have a, you know, time dependency, and then you have just this one value function. Right? So mm -hmm. think about like your say self driving in the real world, right? right. So can, can you have just one value function that, you know, when your environment changes, right? So you got to update, you got to have your value function that, you know, reflects how the real world environment, you know. Right, so if, if, the, if the world is non-stationary, then yeah. of course all of these things are difficult, but the model-based one is also more difficult because presumably now you need to change your model because the world has changed as well. And so, like you need to learn a new model again when the world is different. Like if, 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 if I don't know, you wear, you, the wheels of your robot wear out, right? The dynamics of, of your movement change because you have kind of a wheel that's turning slower. Now, um, everything you've learned about the dynamics needs to be adapted and um, that may be difficult um, in value function space, but it's also difficult in the transition dynamic space. So I think like adapting to a non-stationary world um, is, is, is the same uh, problem for both. Thanks. I, I think still there are many questions, but let's stop here and have coffee outside and then continue discussion. So then let's thank Tom again. <laughs>